There are a bunch of other versions of it that I and some collaborators have thought about how to exploit. And of course, we may be wrong. This hasn't all been peer reviewed. We're in the middle of thinking about it, but so far it seems good. Uh, but it looks like we could achieve long atmospheric lifetimes, much longer than before, because they're levitated. We could move things out of the stratosphere into the mesosphere, in principle solving the ozone problem. Uh, I'm sure there will be other problems that arise. And finally, we could make the particles migrate to over the poles, so we could arrange the climate engineering so it really focused on the poles, which would have minimal bad impacts in the mid of the planet where we live, and do the maximum job of what we might need to do, which is cooling the poles in case of planetary emergency, if you like. So this is a new idea that's crept up that, that may be essentially a cleverer idea than putting sulfates in. Whether this idea is right or some other idea is right, I think it's almost certain that we will eventually think of cleverer things to do than just putting sulfur in. That if engineers and scientists really turn their minds to this, it's amazing how we can affect the planet. The one thing about this is it gives us extraordinary leverage. This, this improved science and engineering will, whether we like it or not, give us more and more leverage to affect the planet, to control the planet, to give us weather and climate control, not because we plan it, not because we want it, just because science delivers it to us bit by bit with better knowledge of the way the system works and better engineering tools to affect it. Now suppose that um, space aliens arrived on, maybe they're gonna land at the UN headquarters down the road here, or maybe they'll pick a smarter spot, but um, <laughs> suppose they arrive and they give you a box and the box has two knobs. One knob is the knob for controlling global temperature. Maybe another knob is a knob for controlling CO2 concentrations. You might imagine that we would fight wars over that box because we have no way to agree about where to set the knobs. We have no global governance and different people will have different places they want it set. Now, I don't think that's gonna happen. It's not very likely, but um, we're building that box. The scientists and engineers of the world are building it piece by piece in their labs, even when they're doing it for other reasons, even when they're thinking they're just working on protecting the environment. They have no interest in crazy ideas like engineering the whole planet. They develop science that makes it easier and easier to do. And so I guess my view on this is not that I want to do it, I do not, but that we should move this out of the shadows and talk about it seriously because sooner or later we'll be confronted with decisions about this and it's better if we think hard about it, even if we want to think hard about reasons why we should never do it. Uh, I'll give you two different ways to think about this problem that are the beginning of my thinking about how to think about it. But what we need is not just a few oddballs like me thinking about this, we need a broader debate, a debate that involves musicians, scientists, philosophers, uh, writers who get engaged with this question about climate engineering and think seriously about what its uh, implications are. So here's one way to think about it, which um, is that we just do this instead of cutting emissions because it's cheaper. I guess the thing I haven't said about this is it is absurdly cheap. It's conceivable that say using the sulfates method or this method I've come up with, you could uh, create an ice age at a cost of 0.001% of GDP. It's very cheap. We have a lot of leverage. It's not a good idea, but it's just important. I'll tell you how big, how big the lever is. The lever is that big. And that, that calculation isn't much in dispute. You might argue about the, the sanity of it, but the leverage is, 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 is real. So because of this, we could deal with the problem simply by uh, uh, stopping uh, 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 reducing emissions and just as, as concentrations go up, we can increase the amount of geoengineering. I don't think anybody takes that seriously because under this scenario, we walk further and further away from the current climate. You have all sorts of other problems like ocean acidification that come from CO2 in the atmosphere anyway. Uh, nobody but maybe one or two very odd folks really suggest this. But here's a case which is harder to reject. Let's say that we don't do geoengineering. We do what we ought to do, which is get serious about cutting emissions but we don't really know how quickly we have to cut them. There's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how much climate change is too much. So let's say that we work hard and we actually don't just tap the brakes, but we step hard on the brakes and really reduce emissions and eventually reduce concentrations. And maybe someday like 2075, October 23rd, we finally reach the, that glorious day where concentrations have peaked and are rolling down the other side. And we have global celebrations and we've actually started to, you know, we, we, we've seen the worst of it. But maybe on that day, we also find that the Greenland ice sheet is really melting unacceptably fast. 
uh, fast enough to put meters of sea level uh, uh, in the, in, uh, on the oceans in the next uh, 100 years and remove some of the biggest cities from the map. That's an absolutely possible scenario. We might decide at that point that even though geoengineering was uncertain and morally unhappy, that it's a lot better than not geoengineering. And that's a very different way to look at the problem. It's using this as risk control, not instead of action. It's saying that you do some geoengineering for a little while to take the worst of the heat off, not that you use it as a substitute for action. But there is a problem with that view. And the problem is the following. Knowledge that geoengineering is possible makes the climate impacts look less fearsome, and that makes a weaker commitment to cutting emissions today. This is what economists call a moral hazard. And that's one of the fundamental reasons that this problem is so hard to talk about. And then in general, I think it's the underlying reason that it's been politically unacceptable to talk about this. But you don't make good policy by hiding things in a drawer. I'll leave you with three questions and then one final quote. Should we do serious research on this topic? Should we have a national research program that looks at this? Not just at how you would do it better, but also what all the risks and downsides of it are. Right now you have a few enthusiasts talking about it, some in a positive side, some in a negative side, but that's a dangerous state to be in because there's very little depth of knowledge on this topic. A very small amount of money would get us some. Many of us, maybe now me, think we should do that, but I have a lot of reservations. My reservations are principally about the moral hazard problem. And I don't really know how we can best avoid the moral hazard. I think there is a serious problem as you talk about this. People begin to think that they don't need to work so hard to cut emissions. Another thing is, maybe we need a treaty. Maybe we need a treaty that decides who gets to do this. Right now we may think of a big rich country like the US doing this, but it might well be that in fact, if China wakes up in 2030 and realizes that the climate impacts are just unacceptable, they may not be very interested in our moral conversations about how to do this. And they may just decide they'd really rather have a geoengineered world than a non-geoengineered world. And we'll have no international mechanism to figure out who makes the decision. So here's one last thought, which is said much, much better in the, a, a, a 25 years ago in the US National Academy report than I can say today. And I think it really summarizes where we are here. That the CO2 problem, the climate problem that we've heard about, is driving lots of things, innovations in energy technologies that will reduce emissions. But also, I think inevitably, it will drive us towards thinking about climate and weather control, whether we like it or not. And it's time to begin thinking about it, even if the reason we're thinking about it is to construct arguments uh, uh, for why we shouldn't do it. Thank you very much.